I've been using the GH4 since it first came out, and I still love it. I skipped over the GH5 series for reasons I can't really explain, but when the GH6 was announced, I knew it was time to upgrade. I almost went for the GH5 Mark II instead, but the GH6 4K at 120p was just too tempting. Plus, I always want the latest and greatest gear. This camera is exciting. I really love it. I didn't leave a rating for the autofocus because I haven't used it yet. I'm more of a manual focus person. Maybe one day I'll try it out. The LCD screen is bright, clear, and just wonderful, and the viewfinder is absolutely amazing. The video quality is superb, which everyone knows. But for the last three years or so, I've also been getting into landscape photography. I plan on getting the OM, one camera soon since I'm switching completely to the MFD system, but honestly, the GH6 is extremely capable. I have no complaints. Everything is easy to use and access. Battery life. The GH4 had an incredible battery life. It seemed to last forever. I've read and heard that the GH6 battery isn't as good, but I disagree. While it's not quite at the level of the GH4, it's still a solid battery and lasts quite well. I bought one extra battery when I got the camera and a week later. I bought the Nomoa DMW BLK22 replacement battery, two pack and dual USB charger kit. These batteries so far last almost as long as the original. SD cards. If I had to complain about something, it would be the type of cards this camera uses. I prefer having dual SD card slots. I haven't tested the CF Express Type-B card yet because I'm waiting for Panasonic to send me my free promotional Lexer card. I bought two new SD cards for the GH6. PNY 128GB Elite X Pro 90 Class 10U 3V 90 UHS-2 SDXC Memory Card. SanDisk 128GB Extreme Pro UHS-2 SDXC Memory Card. Both cards are flawless. I've pushed them hard, and they've performed solidly. I've always used PNY cards from the start and never had a failure. I've had one SanDisk card break physically but not fail performance-wise. Both brands are great, but PNY is much cheaper for the same specs. The Nikon Z9 feels incredibly solid and reliable. Its build quality instills confidence, especially in harsh weather, a testament to Nikon's reputation for durability. Although it's lighter than the D6, it's packed with far more features. The range of video options is expansive, including ProRes and RAW, with 4K and 8K up to 60 frames per second. I've used it extensively for video, and it has exceeded all expectations. In terms of battery life, this camera is a beast. I've seen it shoot 4,000 still images on a single charge. In my own use, I've comfortably taken 1,800 shots with plenty of battery left. The menu system is, in my opinion, the best around. Clean, well-organized, and very user-friendly. The touchscreen is highly responsive, quick, and offers excellent detail. The still image quality is phenomenal. With a base ISO of 64 that renders images incredibly clear and smooth, almost like looking through glass. Combining top-tier video capabilities with a premium price point, and lenses from the Z series that are both competitively priced and superb in quality, the Nikon Z9 stands out. Nikon is definitely on the rise with this one. As a mate and photographer on a para sailboat, my camera faces extreme conditions daily. I use the Fujifilm X-T5 for 10 hours a day, five days a week, for an entire year in this challenging environment. In conditions of extreme humidity, frequent splashes of salt water, and temperatures soaring over 100 degrees, the X-T5 has been incredibly resilient. I change the SD card about 30 times a day, and despite this rough treatment, the camera remains in excellent working condition. Fujifilm's claim that this camera is weatherproof is no exaggeration. After a year of heavy use, the X-T5 functions perfectly internally. With over 100,000 shutter clicks, it's still going strong. The only issue I've encountered is with the shutter button. Due to the salt and constant moisture, it eventually jammed up. After months of dealing with this problem, I superglued a screw-in button from Amazon onto the shutter button. While I send this one in for repair, I've been using an X-T4 as a backup. 
If you plan to use the X-T5 outdoors, especially in tough conditions, buy a screw-in shutter button from Amazon and install it from day one. If the shutter button were still functional, my camera would be perfect after a year of rigorous use. I couldn't be happier with its performance. As always, Fujifilm delivers stunning colors. Once you get the settings right, the X-T5 is highly customizable and user-friendly. I absolutely love my new Canon EOS R5. I decided to get it with insurance, just to be on the safe side, but I'm completely obsessed with it. I upgraded from the Canon 5D Mark IV, so this is my first mirrorless camera. The live exposure simulation and the ability to view setting menus and review images through the viewfinder have been amazing. The quality is incredible, and I'm currently using it with the Canon EFRF adapter that has the control ring feature, so I can still use all my L-series EF lenses. So far, I haven't noticed any loss in quality or performance with my EF lenses, which is a huge relief because after splurging on this beauty, I definitely can't afford to upgrade to RF glass right away. For still life photography, I highly recommend this camera. I haven't tried out the video features yet, so I can't speak for the videography side of things, but as a photographer, I'm in absolute heaven with this camera. After a decade or more with my first generation A7, I decided to upgrade to the A7 IV. If you liked how small the A7 was well expect the A7 IV to be more of the thickness of most other cameras. The most noticeable difference is the autofocus speed, which is significantly faster. Even older lenses, like my 55mm Zeiss, perform exceptionally well on this camera. The next thing I noticed is the camera body's increased thickness, about twice as thick as the original A7. If you like the compact size of the A7, you'll find the A7 IV to be more in line with the thickness of most other cameras. This added bulk is mainly due to the sensor stabilization, a feature absent in the original A7. With my A7, I used to rely on a monopod because the lack of stabilization made handheld shooting prone to handshake issues. The A7 IV, however, allows me to get very sharp images without any additional support. Another point worth mentioning is the camera's dual ISO capability. This is both a benefit and a potential drawback. The benefit is that shooting at 100 ISO or 400 ISO yields images with almost identical noise levels. The drawback is that using intermediate ISO settings like 125, 160, 200, 250, or 320 can result in less sharp images if you're not aware of this feature. To avoid this, it's best to stick to 100 and 400 ISO for most situations and adjust as needed for higher ISOs. I noticed reviewers complaining about the camera menu, but if you're coming from another A7 model, you'll likely find the menu system quite familiar and easy to navigate. All other specifications were as expected. A massive increase in autofocus points, better video recording capabilities, a full HDMI slot, dual SD card slots, and more. However, Sony's decision to exclude a wall charger for the battery is disappointing. Don't be Apple, please. <laughs>